Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord in this house today. He's worthy of it. You may be seated all over the house. You can return to your seats. Thank you for being here on any weekend, but especially such an extraordinary time of celebration. I want to take our text in the book of Philippians chapter 3 today. We're going to continue to talk about the glory of God. We're just going to divert from our Old Testament verse-by-verse series on the glory of God and what the glory of God produces in our life and jump into the New Testament so we can see what the glory of the resurrection does in our life. We want to to celebrate that today. We want to talk about it. So I want you to have your Bibles. I want you to have your journals and envelopes or whatever you have available to write some things down. A short pencil is better than a long memory. And some of us have been blessed and gifted with a good memory, but it'll go away one day. Jot some things down in the word of the Lord. If I learned anything this week, it's to pay attention to details when something is said in the Bible. Because every word of God is for our learning and for our admonition. There is not one word in the Bible, not even an A, an, or a the, that is misdirected or misplaced. It's important. It is the word of the Lord, and we should treat it with reverence as such. Amen, church? We should respect the Bible, read the Bible, love the Bible, devour the Bible, eat the Bible, read the Word of God, memorize the Word of God, live within the context of the Word of God every day of our life. And so today I I do want to deal somewhat with the, the glory of the resurrection because indeed there is an empty tomb. And if there's one thing I can say about going to Jerusalem, it's the simple fact that Jesus is alive. It is a historical fact that Jesus Christ is alive. Now, we prayed a moment ago, and so I'm, I'm already in. So if you're timing preachers, hit it right now, because I'm about to go in high gear. So when you go to Jerusalem, what you'll find out is that people all over that place believe indeed that Jesus is alive. First Corinthians chapter 15 says that he was seen of more than 500 people at once. Now, let that simmer down and soak in to the, to the soil of your soul for just a moment. How many of you, and you know, we don't have to necessarily brag about this, but we know that we're a church where broken people find new meaning to life. How many of you ever been to court for a serious situation? Put your hand high in the air. All right, that's most of our crowd, amen, mine included. Let me tell you something about court. In our judicial system in the United States of America, it only takes one witness to put you under the jail or to set you free for the rest of your life. You mean to tell me that 500 credible people went on record and said, we saw Jesus Christ of Nazareth after he got out of the grave, and you're going to tell me that those 500 doctors, prostitutes, preachers, lawyers, Pharisees, people from every walk of life, every size, every shape, every nationality you can imagine, are you telling me all those people lied? Let me tell you something. 500 witnesses would stand up in any court on the planet, ladies and gentlemen. The most significantly, historically accurate fact is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it is just as, if not more so, significant this morning in this tent outside of Nashville, Tennessee, as it was 2,000 years ago when Jesus got up out of the grave and the stone wasn't rolled away so Jesus could get out. It was rolled away so we could look in and know the tomb is empty so our hearts can be filled with the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's alive. He walks amongst us. He is alive. Romans chapter 2 says that Jesus Christ was powerfully declared to be the Son of God, comma, by the resurrection of the dead. You see, there's a lot of leaders of a lot of institutions, denominations, sects, cultures, cults, groups, organizations, and institutions But there is only one group of people on the planet who has a leader that died and is no longer dead. You better know something. The prophets of old lived and died and they're dead. Mary Baker Patterson Glover and all points West Steady of the Christian science movement, which isn't Christian or scientific, she died and she's still dead. 
Little known fact. She was buried with a telephone. Now, it'd be an old time. He wanted them rotary deal. She was buried with a telephone. Ain't nobody ever called it. And if they did, it would never get answered because she's still dead. Buddha's dead. Confucius and the rest of that confused crowd, dead. Muhammad, dead. Absolutely, positively, without a doubt. Hitler, dead. Napoleon, dead. George Washington, dead. Stalin, dead. All of them dead. Abraham Lincoln, dead. Great preachers of the past, dead. Jesus is not dead. He is accurately, biblically, prophetically, historically, and in every other way alive this very moment. It's the one doctrine that separates biblical New Testament Christianity from every other doctrine and every other group on the planet. We serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty conqueror or his foes. He arose victorious over the vast domain and he lives forever with his saints to reign. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ is alive this morning, but you better know this. When you wake up tomorrow, he'll still be alive. When you get up Thursday, he'll still be alive. When you're having a bad day, he'll still be alive. When you're broke as a joke and considering a diamond dangle both legs, he's still alive. When Israel's at war, he's still alive. When Ukraine's at war, he's still alive. If Biden's in the White House, He's still alive, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus is alive. And because he lives, I can live and face tomorrow. I refuse to be defeated. I refuse to not live in peace. I refuse to not live in victory. Not going to walk around with a poochy mouth disease full of a spirit of anxiety and depression and heaviness. Oh, no. He is alive. And because he's alive, we have life more abundantly. The American church is content with boring worship. Lukewarm approach to the things of God. It's why we're such a magnet for the media. Because we're an anomaly. And I like it. I don't want to fit in with the average church. This is not the church you grew up in or grandmama's church or the church down the road or denomination this or denomination that. I find it interesting that in Israel, the pastor said, look, I know you're going to preach the Bible, so I don't really have to tell you what to say or what not to say. He said, but I would just suggest you don't talk about denominations because our people don't know what that means. <laughs> Woo! Holy smokes, Brother DR, wouldn't we have revival in America if we didn't know what denomination meant? These people just show up and serve God at the expense of their own livelihoods and sometimes their own life. And so we want to talk about the Apostle Paul for just a moment, but I'll tell you one thing. You start walking roads to Damascus, you'll start seeing the Bible different. You start sitting down at a picnic table, and this guy opens up his phone and says, read this story right here. And I read the story, and he's like, hey, do you realize that where you're reading this story is where this happened? And I'm like, whoo, I'm about to have a conniption. <laughs> We're, we're in synagogues, which, by the way, are as big as this platform. 150 people crammed into them. They, we think they're big old mega churches. No, no, no. When them demons started getting stirred up, all that religious crowd started getting nervous. I mean, they were close. I mean, 100, 150 people crammed into a room like sardines in a can. Jesus starts talking about the power and the authority of the word of God, and a demon starts manifesting right in the synagogue. And I said, you mean to tell me we're in one of those synagogues? He said, right now. I was like, whoo, help me, Holy Spirit. To drive by certain places. To go to a place called Magdala. Where what we're finding out now is not where Mary Magdalene is from. It's the town that was named after her. Because she was a pretty influential and affluent individual. That's a message for another time. Man, I found out some stuff that blow my mind. I'm like, they taught me wrong in seminary. I'm thinking to myself, I don't think these Bible teachers ever been to Israel because what they said is total opposite what's right before my very eyes. Biblically, accurately, archaeologically, I'm looking at it. That ain't what they told me because what they told me didn't fit the narrative of the denominational hierarchy. 
You see, you cannot ever be the same. I'll get to the text. This part of it. You can't ever be the same when you stand on the Mount of Olives. And you see, and I told my wife, I said, you know what amazes me? This is the most valuable fought over piece of real estate on the planet. And it's tiny, little bitty, insignificant dot on the map. Tiny. Whole town looks the same way. Old Jerusalem, New Jerusalem, limestone everywhere. And listen, they don't have, other than what happened in Gaza, the media is trying to tell you that there's all kind of stuff going on. Listen, he said, I couldn't tell you the last time we ever had a kidnapping. Kids walking around at midnight by themselves in the streets. Women jogging. Middle of the night, by themselves. He said, we don't have stabbings. We don't have kidnappings. We don't have any of that. They stopped. They put a wall up. We better figure that out. They put a wall up, I said, and stopped all the terrorists from coming over and blowing up buses. And he said, man, it's, it's just so safe. And I, I got up one morning just by my, I couldn't sleep. I, just got, I said, hey, baby. I said, uh, I'm going to leave the hotel. I'm going to walk to Old Drew. I'm going to go to the wall. I went down to the waiting wall all by myself. It's 630 in the morning. Then people down there, ah! they're serious about it. They're down there crying for a Messiah that's already showed up and some of you know he showed up and you ain't cried after him in years. Them Jews down there got sideburns make Elvis look silly. Wearing them hat, walking around. People say, well, you know, y'all reading too much Bible. I ain't never seen people walk around town reading so much Bible. Here you go, about everybody reading this. All of us Hebrew, we're walking around Bibles in their hand. It's crazy. And people are like, well, you know, we just, that's just not our culture. No, you see, our, our culture is, let's just be casual. Let's read a Bible when it makes us feel good. Now we'll lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And the whole world giving people a hard time for not believing in the Messiah when one day they will believe in the Messiah. But let me tell you something. They believe in what they believe more than we actually believe in a historical Messiah. Because they live there, they know the tomb is empty. And every apostle died saying the tomb is in. How many people you know would die for a lie? I ain't never met one. If I think it's a lie, I'd be like, well, you know, we can fight for it so I can preserve the history, but I ain't dying for it. Every one of them died to say Jesus is alive. Kill him, kill him, kill him, kill him, kill him, kill him. All through the crusades, kill him, kill him, kill him, kill him. All through all of these years of the Spanish Inquisition, kill him, kill him, kill him, kill him. There's not one doctrine on the planet that more people have died for than that of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you're going to tell me that he's still rotting somewhere in a tomb? And we're like, well, you know, church, you know, once a year is good for me. Let me tell you once a year, people, something. You see, I'm not one of these guys trying to build a crowd. I'm trying to build a church for the body of Christ. If you show up to keep your mama off your back around Christmas and Easter, you're a creaster and you ought to get your heart right with God. I don't care if you ever come back or not. I'm not here to make you like me. I'm here to let you fall in love with Jesus. Go to church one time a year. Talk about how much you love God. These people go to a wall every day. They're rocking back and forth at 4 o'clock in the morning. 4 o'clock in the morning. Chanting stuff I don't even understand. Men on one side, women on the other. They don't even let them women over in that synagogue, which, by the way, makes so much historical proof for why Paul said, I suffer not a woman to teach or to even speak in church. It was their culture. It wasn't a doctrine keeping women from being able to preach. I'm telling you, if you go there, you'll find out that there were so many women that followed Jesus. His ministry wouldn't have even been successful without prophetic women around him. There ain't a man one in the Bible but Joseph of Arimathea that gave Jesus a tomb. Ain't a man one in the Bible ever gave Jesus money that we know about. But I can show you a whole list of women that gave him money so he could preach. But to see it and see that big gaudy dome of the rock and know in my heart you coming down and have absolutely no qualms in offending people saying that. I don't care. They're going to blow it up. You say they're, they're going to incite the rage of Muslims. Please don't be stupid. They already hate us. 
They'd already slice your throat if they had the prime opportunity. Stop all this sympathy. Stop it. Now, you know, there's millions of Arabs being saved. There are Arabs that are not Islamic. So the news says, oh, you hate Muslims because you're prejudiced against Arabs. That's stupid. Arabs were in Acts chapter number two. Before Islam corrupted them with their perversity. We're not against Arabs. We're against a false religious system that wants to keep people in bondage and that says death to Israel, death to America, and death to everyone that doesn't believe the way that we believe. You see, we live in a nation where if you don't like a Bible, apparently you can show up and burn 200 of them before us in church. Right Now, there's ramifications for stuff like that. But when you go over there and you start realizing, wow, it's about to go down. It's about to happen. And I told my wife, I said, look at here, baby. And I mean, it's just like right there on you, right? I was like, look at that hill. Mount of Olives. Gethsemane right at the bottom of it. I said, you, you see this right here? I said, Jesus said that he would place his foot on the Mount of Olives. By the way, the whole thing's a cemetery. Whole thing, Jewish cemetery. And they, they're putting the, the, the rebuilt altar right there. There's a, there's a rabbi that owns the land. I've done my due diligence. I know what's about to happen. I know what's about to happen. But did you know on the Jerusalem side, you see what separates Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives is the Kidron Valley which run into what we call the Valley of Gehenna, the Valley of Hinoim. And I learned some great things about that. But nonetheless, you can tell I'm full. Woo. But I'm going to say, I told my wife, we stand on top of Herod's palace. We looked, I said, you see that hill of that little grassy spot? I said, Jesus going to put his foot down right there. He's going to walk down past the Garden of Gethsemane. He's going to cross the Kidron Valley. And you know what the Muslims did on the Jerusalem side? They built a cemetery outside the walls of Jerusalem. Built a whole cemetery. And then years ago, bricked up the eastern gate. You know, Nehemiah rebuilt the gate. about Fish gate and this gate and Jaffa gate and all, all these gates. Well, one of them's completely dammed up. I mean, it don't even have to have a lock on it. I mean, it's nothing but concrete limestone. They, you can see the arches. They dammed the whole thing up. And I told my wife, I said, <laughs> that silly little Muslim cemetery thinks they're going to keep Jesus, the high priest, from showing up doing what he's supposed to do. His feet's going to hit the Mount of Olives. He's going to walk down past the Garden of Gethsemane. He's going to come across the Kidron Valley. He's going to walk up through them bunch of dead Muslims in them tombs. He's going to kick open the eastern wall. He's going to walk in with a rod of iron. He's going to rule and reign. And I don't know about you, but it's coming to a town near you. You better be ready because we're going to reign with him, church. We're going to reign with him. I seen where it's going to happen. I watched it with my eyes. We drive down the road. He said, hey, that's Mount Carmel. I'm like, whoo, I'm about to have a come apart. That's Samaria. Oh, see that house over there? That's where John the Baptist in a dungeon got his head cut off. It was like, it was like living in a comic book. For the first time, uh, Joseph Z ever prophesied over my wife. He said, you know what I see about you? He said, your life's like an infomercial. This, 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 this. Oh, but wait, there's more. This, 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 this. Oh, but wait, there's more. Sham wow. Oh, but wait, there's more. So like every moment of the day, I was like, oh, wait, there's more. Woo. Oh, wait, there's more. Oh, wait, there's more. She took her socks and shoes off and got out in the Galilee water and started picking up rocks. He said, you know what's significant about this spot? I said, what's that? He said, this is where Jesus looked at Peter and said, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And I'm sitting there thinking, whoo, I love him a whole lot more after I learned that. It was fantastical. But I've seen the results of the power of his resurrection. I've seen the historical ramifications for what will be fulfilled prophecy. Every bit of it's going to happen. It's going to happen. I don't know. Next month during their specific time of Passover. I don't know what the preacher's going to do. I don't know what Islam's going to do. Because now we found out that October 
if you watch the news at all, we found out that the Islamic terrorists, Hamas, went on a news conference. They always cover their face because that's what cowards do. Or people that believe in COVID. But uh, nonetheless... Inhale. Nonetheless, I digress. But he said one of the reasons they were attacked, one of the biggest reasons is in a disrespectful way, they said, we had to kill the superstition of the red cow nonsense in Israel. You know why? Because every Muslim knows the prophecy of the third temple. And they know exactly where it has to go. So he says, well, don't you know what that's going to cause internationally? Don't you realize that America and the UN right now have turned their backs on Israel already? So don't tell me about international peace, peace treaties. Don't, don't come at me with this. Well, you know what we need is a two-state solution. You know what two-state solution means? It means give it all to them and Israel will be destroyed. There's no two-state solution. It all belongs to Israel. Every last drop of it. Somebody says, well, you know, can, can, can you show me like the, the legal rights to the land? Yeah, I sure can. They're right here in the Bible. Right here in the Bible. So all of that to say, I, I don't know what's going to happen next month. Who knows? If, if, if that preacher calls me and says, hey, it's happening. You know me, I might, I might take a load and go watch it. I don't know. I'll be there the night it happens. I, I'll be a part of history and be a part of prophecy. I don't care. You see, I ain't, I ain't for sale. I ain't playing games with people no more. I've done seen where his foot's going to touch down. I've done seen it. I've seen the valley he's going to walk through. I've seen the doors he's going to kick open. I've seen where he's going to sit. Toward the city of David underground. In the hidden, carved out tunnels of Hezekiah. Walking in places that sometimes tourism can't take you. Climb down under Jerusalem. Way, 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 way down. He said, you, you see how far down that was? I said, yeah. He said, they used to ride mules down here. That's how they get them in here. I was like, oh, that's interesting. But let me tell you what was really interesting. I'm preaching. We got to a certain spot where the Gihon River was whoo, just a flowing in the ground. He said, read this. And David said to Zadok the priest, put my son Solomon on a donkey. Take him down to the Gihon Spring and anoint him there as the king of Israel. And when I stood in a spot where Zadok the priest anointed Solomon to be the wisest and richest king that the nation of Israel and Jerusalem ever know. I'm telling you, I like to have a Holy Ghost come apart in front of the tour guide. I'm telling you, goose pimples so big. I mean, just popping up all over me. I could feel the hair on the back of my neck standing. We'd, we'd go places. He'd say things. I'd be like, you got to be kidding me. Show me how they conquered the land. Show me how they came in. And the Jebusites stood on the wall and said, David, you can't come in. Jebusites, that was the place of Jerusalem. He overtook the place that was already built. He said, this is a nice fortress, God. I want you to give it to me. You can't get in. You can't get in. You can't get in. You can't climb up the wall. David said, you're right. You ought to see the tunnel they swam through. You talk about David's mighty men. Make most of our people, even in the military, look like sissies. Swim through five, ten feet of water in a cave with no lights just to swim up. Got your sword, got your shield. Swim up in there and take care of them Jebusites turning into the city of Jerusalem. Man, I'm telling you, it was crazy standing there watching all that. And when I got on that plane, the Lord said, not only will you never be the same again, but you listen to me, you better mash the gas more than you've ever mashed it. You better preach harder than you've ever preached. You better pray more than you've ever prayed. You better read longer and read more than you've ever read. You better fast. You better preach, son. You better preach. Ain't got no time to back up and mess around. This stuff's happening. Stuff's happening. We used to hear all the time, well, you know, it's one day it's all going to line up. Well, what you going to do when you hear the fact that it's all lined up right now? It's all lined up right now. 
I don't know what the next six months looks like. I'll let God take care of it. I don't know what the next year looks like. I'll let God take care of it. I don't know what the next 10 years looks like. I'll let God take care of it. But I'm telling you right now, if you think you've got another 50, you're smoking a pipe. Let that sink in. Oh, I'm so burdened for my family. Really? It's about to go down. You better tell them about Jesus right now. Quit waiting. Quit waiting. Well, I'll invite them at Christmas. I'll invite them next Resurrection Sunday. Why don't you invite them Wednesday? Why don't you invite them next Sunday? Why don't you get them under the sound of the gospel of Jesus Christ? This thing's happening. This whole thing's gearing up. It's gearing up. I saw it. I can't be the same. I, I feel like I'd be a blasphemer if I came home the same. To deny what my eyes beheld. To see a nation, as Paul said, zealous. They got zeal without knowledge. Walking around reading the Bible every day. Tassels. Locks of hair. Hats. Yarmulkes. Tradition this, tradition that. Shabbat happens, whole place shuts down. I was drinking cappuccino every day. Shabbat happened, they said, we don't make cappuccino on Shabbat. Excuse me? I'm down in the hotel. I was like, I'd like to have a cappuccino. They said, no, no, no. There's Nescafe in there. You can go make your own, but we don't make cappuccino on Shabbat. I'm like, what? You can't even order a cheeseburger. They, they don't mix dairy and meat. I, I'm telling you, it's like crazy stuff. And I'm like, these people are intense. Even in what we would consider foolishness. And no doubt some of it is because it's been fulfilled. And we look at that and we're like, man, these people are intense. And I'm like, yeah, I can't even get our crowd to read the Bible. Right? We're driving down the road. Lord, don't let a drunk hit me. Lord, you know, just don't let me get mad at the next red light. That's like the consistency of our prayer. I'm at the wailing wall at 630 in the morning with people that are 18 to 30 years old. Like young people rocking up against the wall. <laughs> we come to church, somebody waves their hand, says amen too loud, or waves the flag, and we start getting nervous. I could hear them coming down the streets of Jerusalem. I'm like, well, I'm getting close to the wall. You could hear them. Hear them wailing. They call it a wailing wall for a reason. I didn't even know why the Wailing Wall was there. I mean, it's not, it's not a biblical situation. You know why the Wailing Wall is there? It's the only wall they can get to that's still attached to the Temple Mount that the Muslims ain't took. It's as close as they can get to the Temple. It's as close as the Jews can get to the glory of God in their mindset. If you get Jesus, you get Yeshua, you can get as close as you want to. We know that. They don't. And those blessed people standing outside of a wall trying to get the glory of God. I've been preaching on it for a month and some of you still ain't figured it out yet. And you ain't got to have a wall. You ain't got to have a tent. We ain't got to have an Ark of the Covenant. I got one in my office, praise God, if you want to see it. You don't have to have any of it. We may boldly enter in. Boldly enter in. Am I helping somebody? I know some of you are like, oh my goodness, he didn't get to the text yet. And I may not. Don't worry about it. You know, I used to hear all the time, and I've said this a thousand times. This is one of the things that just kind of got my, my head thinking. We're looking over Jerusalem. We're looking at what is now the, the Temple Mount, what is the, the Dome of the Rock. But we began to see models, and the, the guy's like, let me show you this and this. There was this wall. It looked like a, it looked like a road barrier, like a concrete road barrier down the highway, right? Of course, Tennessee's always got some highway road, road barriers, praise God. It's like the state flower. <laughs> road barriers. So he said, let me point this out to you. He said, you see that wall right there? So we go to the Israeli museum, which most people don't go to, and they had fragments, remains of that, of that wall. And I was like, that's interesting. He said, you see that wall? He said, nobody ever talks about that wall. He said, you know Paul mentioned that wall. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said that he broke down the middle wall of partition between Jews and Gentiles. And I saw a barrier wall where years ago, if a Gentile would have crossed over the concrete barrier, they would have killed him on the spot. Because the temple was only for the Jews. The outer courtyard, as Jesus said, is where some of the Gentiles 
could come and bebop around if they so felt worthy to do so. And he said, see that wall? He said, when Paul said that Jesus broke down the middle wall of partition, he said, in your English mindset, American culture, you don't get it. He said, but in our mindset, what that did is it broke down the barrier between Jew and Gentile, and now both of us have full access to the glory and the presence of God. I always preached, we know the veil was rent. Yeah, the veil was rent. That was for us to get into the presence of God. But the stone wall was broke down so that Jews and Gentiles could come together in the same body of Christ. And I would have never made that correlation unless my eyes had beheld it for their wee little selves. I saw it broke down in my presence. It's all of that to say in Philippians 3. Paul said that I may know him. You, you can mark verse 10. I ain't going to go through all that I may know him. You see, I love you as your friend and shepherd enough to tell you something. Some of you know about him. But you don't know him. Now, I don't even mean from a standpoint of redemption. Some of you can know that you're saved, but not intimately know the one that saved you. I saw a sign in Nashville a couple years ago. I was stricken that I even saw it. I was like, wow, I can't believe somebody put that out. It said, and I quote, does Jesus know you're saved? That's a pretty good sign. Oh, I'm saved, I'm saved, I know Jesus. Yeah, does Jesus know you? And Paul said, here's my main goal in life, that I may know him, I want to intimately, passionately, romantically, in every way, authoritatively, I want to know God. Why? So we can make him known. And you can't make somebody known if you don't know them intimately. But what does that have to do with today? Everything. Because he says next, and the power. Shout power. power. Shout power. power. Shout power. power. And the power of his resurrection. Wait a minute. The same power that pulled Jesus out of a damp, dark tomb is the same power that defeats addictions in your life to this very day. Defeats demons and strongholds and temptations in your life to this very day. The same power that got Jesus out of a tomb is the same power that holds your marriage together in this tent. Same power. Same power. Power, power. He said, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. He said, I want an empty tomb to affect me practically. See, historically we can talk about it. Prophetically we can talk about it. We, we, oh yeah, no, no, no. Practically, has the resurrection changed your life? If it hasn't, something's wrong. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. Do we believe it? Do we believe it? It should change us. The fact that the same power that pulled Jesus out of a grave is the same power that has been placed within me, the dunamis power of God. Same power. And that's why God can say to the early church, and you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you won't sit around bored Twiddling your thumbs with nothing to do. No, no, no. You'll go out and be witnesses. You'll start right here in Jerusalem, and then you'll go out from there, and you'll change the entire region. You'll change the world. You'll change social media. You'll change your church. You'll change this campus. You'll change your marriage. You'll change your mind and change your heart and change your life about some stuff when the power comes upon you. And the same power that got Jesus out of a grave is the same power that we have in this tent. It's the glory of God. It's accessible to us now. Of his resurrection. Well, I just, I just, I just can't stop. Whatever the power of his resurrection to help you put that bottle down. 
The power of his resurrection will let you flush them pills down the toilet. The power of his resurrection can change everything about your home, everything about this campus, everything about this nation. The power of his resurrection. Now let me say this, because I've taught a lot and talked a lot. Not that I'm apologizing, I'm just saying. We like that aspect of the gospel. It's powerful, and we should. Okay, it's what sets other dead religious leaders apart. Okay, we get it. He died. He was buried. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5. He rose from the dead. He's no longer dead anymore. Okay, we get that. Everybody wants the power of the resurrection without an afternoon of crucifixion. Everybody wants to be anointed without being spit on. Hmm? Everybody wants to be pat on the back. Nobody wants to get slapped in the face. Huh? Everybody wants an attaboy. Nobody wants to pray and, and sweat great drops of blood in a garden of an olive press. And say, not my will, but thine be done. Everybody wants the power. Of his resurrection. Nobody wants the next part of the verse. The fellowship of his sufferings. Years ago. I won't be too hard on myself. I used to be a little naive in that verse. I've since grown out of it. And I would say things like this. Well you know the Bible says. We have to fellowship with our sufferings. So what that means is. Just get up a little extra early on Monday morning. And get you some coffee. And you just sit down. You just talk to your problems. You just, talk, you just fellowship. With your suffering. That ain't what it means. It means when you suffer, it's the greatest time and level of fellowship that you will ever have with the one that understands your suffering. Because he was tempted at all points like as we are yet without sin. He has a touch, a soft spot in his heart for infirmity, temptation, hardship. So we've said it a thousand times. Let's say it a thousand and one. Everybody wants the power. Nobody wants the process. Everybody wants the glory of resurrection morning without the humiliation of crucifixion afternoon. And by the way, I'm convinced. I love that uh, Brother DR said something about this. I think it was yesterday I saw it. I was like, mash a gas, brother, go for it. People argue about dumb stuff. He's crucified on Wednesday. He's crucified on Friday. How do you get three days? Stop. He's alive. Get over your mathematical calculations of how it worked out. I don't have to explain it. By the way, they can explain it just fine and it makes a whole lot of sense. But in our little American mindset, we can't. We're so weak and cheap when it comes to the Bible. It's a shame that Orthodox Jews who do not even believe the Messiah know a thousand times more Bible than people that have been to Bible college and have preached for 50 years in the United States of America. And people that don't even believe the gospel yet... Individually, because individual Jews have to get saved the same way we do, or they'll all go to hell. But nationally, the hand of God's over them, and a whole nation one day will be born again during the tribulation. It's time of Jacob's trouble, the book says that. But it's shocking to me that there is not a one of us in this room, including myself, that would confidently be able to sit down and biblically from the Old Testament take on an Orthodox Jew that eats your lunch. Because they know all the stuff that we think is boring. They've memorized all the stuff you skipped over because you can't pronounce Chetel Omar or Mayher Shalahashbaz or this one begat this one and this one. Let me tell you something. Sit down at a picnic table in the town where Jesus was born and let the man read to you this one had this one and this one was the son of this one and you can see him sitting at the table with you. It'll change your life. I'm telling you whether I go with you or not, I'll get you connection. I'd start saving up if I was you. It's a lifetime trip. I don't care if it's two days or two weeks. I'm telling you, you will never, ever, ever be able to be the same when you see the Bible through the lens of of the Jewish nation. And if that offends you, know this. Your Savior is Jewish. Your Bible is Jewish. Everything you have from God was given to you by a Jewish nation. Everything. All of it. 
And when I sat there and saw it, I began to understand, oh, the power is resurrection. But then Paul says, yeah, but you better buckle up and buckle in for the fellowship of his sufferings. Some of you have been praying for the power, and that's okay. Pray for it. Pray for authority. But here's the problem. When God answers your prayer, you try to pray your way out of what God put you into to give you the power. Lord, give me power. Lord, give me power. God says, okay, let me crank the heat up. I didn't want that. Give me another way, Lord. And you short circuit and you circumvent and pull the rug out from under the grace of God in your life because you prayed for power, but when God gave you what was going to lead you to the power of the resurrection, you didn't want the fellowship of the sufferings because you just thought, I'm just going to get plugged in, get turned on, and I'm just going to be this great influencer. God's going to give me a, a great big huge page on Facebook or TikTok or Instagram or Twitter X or whatever. I, I'm going to be a massive influencer. I'm here to tell you influencers come and go and never do a thing, but authoritative believers in the gospel of Jesus Christ turn the world upside down like those ragtag redneck hillbilly fishermen did. And Jesus walked through his hometown, saw a man sitting at the receipt of customs. He said, hey, Levi, what are you doing working for the Roman government, taking up taxes? You do realize your name's Levi because you're the Levitical priesthood, preacher boy. Put your money down. Tear them receipts up. Follow me. Hey, James and John. Run over to your dad, kiss him in the face, and say, we're out. We're out. And I, like our God, used to think, oh, poor dad. Poor, pitiful dad. Those two sons of thunder went in there and said, sorry. This rabbi is calling us, and we hate to just drop all the work. We got to leave later. Oh, what am I going to do? No, 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 no. When you go over there, you recognize something real quick. That dad threw a party. He was like, what? Because you see, in a Jewish mindset, it's a rabbi that chooses you to follow them. And this miracle-working rabbi came walking through town and said, you two boys, don't ask any questions. Tell your daddy bye. We write it down. And they said, shh, shh, what about now? And daddy was like, whoo, my boys were picked by a rabbi. Hmm? Puts a whole new perspective on it when you sit in the spots where it happened. So we've gone a long way around the barn. We've done a little talk, talking, laughing, crying, teaching, preaching, a little amalgamation of the whole deal. This is the most shotgun sermon I've preached in a long time. Just let it spread, Lord, let it spread. Pellets all over the room. But I'll tell you this. Woe be unto us if we preach for a month and more than likely several months on the glory of God. And we want it. But woe be unto us when we're not willing to pay the price for it. So I pray deeply this morning that you desire the power and the authority of the resurrection. But I pray even more fervently and pastorally that you will submit to the fellowship of his suffering. Because when you are weak, he is strong. Most gladly, therefore, will I now glory in my infirmities, why, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Would you stand with me all over this room? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, everyone standing. Father, in the name of Jesus, forgive us, Lord, for such a casual approach to the things of God. We all would grab this mic and rah, rah, bishkumba about the power, but we would be gloriously quiet about the process that leads us to the power. Lord, we don't have much time. There's people in this room right now that need to come to this altar and say, God, forgive me for wasting so much time. He's coming, folks. He's coming. God, forgive us for not being 
valuable witnesses to our family and friends and children. Forgive us, Lord, for not being faithful. Forgive us for pretending like we understand things when we live in such biblical arrogance and ignorance. God, forgive us. God, forgive us. God, forgive us. Fill these steps today with hungry hearts of men and women and young people, young men, young ladies, children even, that say, God, I'll pay what price I have to pay. I'll say what needs to be said. I'll not be like the culture. I'm not trying to fit in. I'm trying to stand out for the sake of the kingdom. Some of you need to come and repent and say, God, forgive me for complaining about the sufferings. Help me to embrace them so I can experience the power of his resurrection in my life. Forgive us, Lord, for being quiet and silent and timid and gospel shy. Forgive us for not being courageous. Not walking in the gifts of the glory of God. Lord, today, may people fall on their face and say, Holy Spirit, completely, absolutely baptize me in your presence. Give me the fire power of God in my life, and in doing so, I'll walk through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil. God, forgive us for our timidity. Forgive us for our lack of commitment to the things of God. And oh, Father, today, as your word begs us, we pray for the peace of God's people in Israel, Lord. We cannot turn our backs on them. Oh, God, there's such a blessing upon a church that will walk in that. There's a blessing on a marriage that will walk in that. There's a blessing on a nation that will walk in that. And God, don't let us stray farther than we've already strayed in turning our back on the people of God. God, forgive us as a nation. We repent. God, we repent. We repent. We repent. So right now, all over this room, many people have begun to come. I want you to slip out right now and say, oh, God, look, I do want the glory. Yes, God, I do want the power. But I promise, Lord, I'll be willing to crawl on that cross. I'll be willing to die to myself every day. I'll be willing to have some friends and family walk out of my life if need be. I'll be willing. I'll be willing. I'll be faithful to the things of God. I'll be a faithful servant of the kingdom. I'll be a faithful servant of the church of the living God. No more lackadaisical. No more lukewarm. No more half-hearted. No more a little bit in and all the way out. Oh, no, fully in, fully engulfed in the things of God. Drench me in your power and presence, Lord. Give me a holy courage, a holy boldness. Some of you need to come today, pray for your family. Pray for your family. You see, you're not going to think when the news story breaks in the next few weeks or months, when it, when it breaks this year and they say, oh my goodness, it has begun. You're going to think to yourself, why am I not being urgent? You see, the message of the gospel is urgency. Urgency. Your kids need urgency urgency your marriage needs urgency teenagers young adults gen z you need urgency and you have it far more than we in my generation could ever imagine come on come on right now all over the room all over the room miss billy and our crew is over there at the baptismal if you today are going to follow the lord in believers baptism then just begin to leave your seat if you're praying take your time but just begin to leave your seat we got little changing rooms if you have never followed the lord in water baptism today is your day not next week not next easter no right now today is your day young and old alike i'm going to preach on it probably next week when we talk a little bit more about the day of pentecost i never understood until i stood on that spot i never understood how they successfully baptized three thousand converts at the same time until i went there and i stood and i saw it for myself it makes so much sense it makes so much sense first thing you ought to do after you repent and believe the gospel is get water baptized it's what the bible teaches you start getting ready we'll get your towels we'll get you lined up we'll get your name tag we'll get you in the line and we'll see you baptized in the name of the lord But you come. You come all over this room. You come.
If you need extra prayer today, if you're not even at this altar, but you need extra prayer, you get down here right now. We'll have one of our prayer members and deliverance team lay hands on you. We will pray for you. If you need healing today, come on. If you need deliverance today, right now, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we come against every spirit of witchcraft that would be over this tent right now. In Jesus' mighty name, we come against it right now. Every religious spirit, in the name of Jesus, we command you to come off the people of God right now. We command it. We command it in Jesus' mighty name. Spirits of infirmity, spirits of cancer, we rebuke you in the mighty name of Jesus. Spirits of unforgiveness, we call you forth right now. and We say you must come out of every man. You must come out of every woman. We speak life over you today in the mighty name of Jesus. You need help. You need prayer. Slip your hand up. We'll get to you right now. We'll get to you right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I need some team members. Get on up here. Come on right now in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. If you've never been saved, you need to repent, sir. You need to repent, ma'am. Right now, you need to call on the name of the Lord and say, I'm a sinner. I deserve hell. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. Change me, Jesus. I accept you today as my Savior, as my Messiah. I receive you today. Save me, Jesus. I'm a sinner. Save me, Jesus. I submit to you. Do that. Do that. You need help? Come on down here. We'll pray with you. Receive him today. Receive him today. Be cleansed today. Be healed today. Be saved today. Be baptized today. Be delivered today. Be set free today. Be at peace and joy today, church. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Come on, come on, come on. Take as long as you need. Keep coming, keep praying. Begin the lineup for our baptismal celebrations, young and old alike. We'll baptize every person wanting to follow the Lord in water baptism today. We do not ever have an official dismissal at Global Vision, so you can remain for the baptisms. Our team's going to begin to worship. Men in the morning, we still will be on track. 6 a.m., right here in the hospitality room, Bible study. We're in the book of Exodus. Six o'clock in the morning, men, we will be meeting together, all right? I know I'm a little jet lagged and stuff. That's all right. I believe it's important. I don't want to miss it. Six o'clock in the morning, men, pack that room out like you have been. Let's put chairs out. Standing room only. Get here. Let's get serious. Time short. Time short. Time short. Get here in the morning. Six o'clock. We're going to meet together. You get around. You love each other. You fellowship one with another. We never say you're dismissed. We just say, we'll see you again. We'll see you men in the morning. We'll see everyone else on Wednesday night. Next week, we want you back. We want you back. We want you back. We'd love to have you here at our church. If you don't come to our church, go to a church. Get faithful. Time's short. Quit messing around. You can't burn the candle of life at both ends and blow the smoke in God's face. He'll not be mocked. Let this be a, a moment when the light bulb comes on and you say, wow, wow, my life's changed. My life's changed. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be faithful to church. I'm going to read the Word of God. I'm going to pray. I'm going to fast. I'm going to tell my coworkers about Jesus. There's going to come a time that the news media is going to tell you what I said is going to happen and you're going to feel ashamed because you've done nothing with it. You've done nothing with it. So just keep getting prayer. Get in line for baptismal celebrations. All of our folks online, our hub leaders, just begin to minister right now in those church buildings and those office complexes and those living rooms right now. Just begin to minister. Just begin to minister. Let the glory of God fill this place. Let the power of his resurrection fill this place. If you're glad you came to church today, give God some praise in his house right now on this resurrection Sunday. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Get what you came for. Get what you came for today. Let's worship him.